that's slight before two, but after zero. After zero. My Savior's love. just oh, be able to see the one who did that for us and be able to touch him and talk to him and just look at him you know it's just gonna be a wonderful day more about that in the morning service yeah amen <laughs> well how's everybody doing it's good to see you god bless you on this windy windy day and it's supposed to continue blowing i guess all the way through uh tomorrow but that's all right I was driving down, of course, where I live there in, in Canyon City, and I'm driving down, and the wind is blowing. Uh, there's a lot of construction going on, and the wind is blowing signs over. Tree limbs are falling down into the streets and everything. It's a mess. And right there close to my house, a big old tree, you know. It's just, but, but here's the thing about the wind. You already know this because I've already taught it to you years ago, but maybe you forgot it. Wind is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. For example, if you were to check it out, and I'd ask you to do it right now, but you can, you can check it out. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church, it came as a rushing, mighty wind. So the Holy Spirit was evidenced by a rushing, which is a quick, mighty, which is powerful, wind. Then when Jesus was dealing with Nicodemus, he told him that, in fact, look at John chapter 3. I want you to just be reminded of this. Look how the Lord expressed this matter about wind in John chapter 3. And that's, of course, the, the chapter where the Lord deals with the religious ruler. But look how, look how he says it here in John chapter 3. And I'm going to go up there to verse uh, number Six, where he says that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit now notice he's talking about the Holy Spirit marvel not that I say unto thee you must be born again so it's the spirit that gives us the birth but look at verse 8 the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth so is everyone that is born of the spirit so God compares our new birth to the wind by the Holy Spirit being an evidence of that wind. For example, you cannot see the wind. 
but you can see the evidences of the wind. I saw the evidences coming by the blowing over signs. I saw the, the, the wind blowing and weaves, uh, leaves and branches and everything scattered. I saw the evidence of the wind. So if we've been born of the Spirit, don't you think you ought to have the evidence of the Spirit? Yeah, because God compares wind to the Spirit, and there ought to be the evidences of that Spirit. And so anyway, that's, uh, the, the Bible's very clear in teaching us those kind of things and, and, and something else about wind. Wind is powerful. Who has the power? The Holy Spirit's power. So we have within us the Holy Spirit. So we have the wind of the power of the Holy Spirit that God wants to use us. And that's why we ought to be able to see the evidences of the Spirit just like you can see the evidences of the wind. You can see it. And so you can't see the wind, but you can see the evidences. Amen? And so uh, the, wind is, the wind is something that we have to put up with. And by the way, something else. I've been out when I was on the ranch. My brother and I used to have to dig post holes for fences. They don't do that anymore, but we have to dig post holes. So we're out there in the, in the plains of Montana, and the wind is blowing and we're digging down in that dirt and throwing the dirt to dig in the post hole, throwing that dirt, and that dirt's blowing back into our faces when the wind's blowing. And I've seen my brother take off his hat, the wind was blowing it anyway, and take off his hat and throw it down. He said, I'm sick of this wind. You know what the wind did? It irritated him. You know what the Holy Spirit does when you're not right? He irritates you. He convicts you. The wind is a conviction, is an irritation. Amen? Awesome. Okay, so much for that. We're now going to try to, did, did I give you all out in the last uh, week? Did I give you the picture of the, of the high priest? I've got some in case you did not. Brother, if you want to maybe pass these out, somebody here. Here we go. Because we're going to try to get to that today and kind of sum up and conclude our, our study. I, there's a new study I want to do for our Sunday school class coming up here real soon, but I want you to take some time here and look at that. That's just kind of a drawing as to what we can come up with the scripture as to how the high priest uh, dressed his uh, garments and that type of thing. And so... I'm going to spend some time on that if I can get to it today, and I'm going, to, I'm going to go very quickly to these other areas that I want you to see. But let me remind you of what we studied last week and, and kind of conclude this matter about the last piece of furniture that we're studying, and that's the Ark of the Covenant. We've gone all the way through. Listen, we have built the Ark. How long have we been on this study? Probably, has it been a year? We've been on this study about the tabernacle, and the tabernacle has been assembled by us from the scripture, so we know all about it. We know about the fence and all what it means around it. We know about the posts and how they represent those that have been redeemed because the post sat in the silver. Silver is always a picture of redemption in the Bible. There was fine twine linen wrapped around. This is, this is so the world could not uh, enter into the tabernacle without going through the proper procedure. So they had this fence all the way around, and that fence represented both the Christians and Christ. Then there was only one way to get into the tabernacle, and that's through the gate, which is also called the way in the Bible. There was only one entrance. And the way, when you walked into that gate, was the uh, brazen altar where the sacrifice was made. And so if you're going to get into the tabernacle where Christ dwelt, and if you're going to get into where Christ is, you have to come by the way of the cross, the sacrifice. That's the first thing. And so that tabernacle, we've gone all the way through this and all of those different pieces and all the different items that there were that shows to us and points to us all, all about Christ. And for those of you who are not here through the full study, I have all of these studies now. Uh, have you got mine going on the CD? Good. Uh, I've got them all. Every study we've had on the tabernacles on CD now, in case you ever want to. And, and I've been, uh, like I told you last week, suggested to put it in book form, but we'll see about that. But anyway, you, you come in by the way. Jesus said, I am the way. way. 
So if you're going to get to God, you've got to come by the way, and the way is the first thing, the sacrifice altar. Jesus was the sacrifice on the altar of the cross. Then if you're going to get closer to the Lord, you have to be cleansed. And the laver that's sitting on the outside, because we're still outside of the tabernacle, we, we pick up the uh, world elements. And so the laver is a type of the word of God because it's the water that's in the laver to wash by. And the water, of course, as you know, is what cleanses us. And it's a reference to the word of God. And so they, the priests would have to stand with their feet in that particular uh, labor and then their hands and, and it was made out of mirrors of the ladies. It says that in your Bible and the Bible is called a mirror and when they would look in to the water down into the mirror it would throw, show a reflection as to what they looked like which would give them a, a view of their sin that needed to be washed by the water. And that's why Jesus said, ye are washed by the water of my word. The word that I have spoken, ye are cleansed by the word which I have spoken. So they had to be cleansed by the labor. Now they're able to step in to the first portion of the tabernacle. The first thing they step into is the candlestick, the lampstand. And it's lit, which gives them now light. So now they're going to be able to be inside and walk in the light. And when you walk in the light, there was the table of showbread. Jesus is the bread of life. A table is a place of fellowship. So we can have fellowship with the bread of life, which is Jesus, because the light gives to us the evidence that we can have fellowship with him. Then the other thing that's there is the uh, altar of incense. The Bible says that the incense would go up over the veil into the holy of holies where God dwelt. And so the incense was a type of prayer. And, of course, Revelation 5, 8 tells you that that's what, what it means and so forth. And so we're getting closer now. And as soon as that incense, here, here, we've come by the way of the cross. We've been washed by the water of the word. We're now walking in the light. We're having fellowship with Christ the bread. And now we pray. And as we pray, that sweetness of that incense goes over. And now that's when the Lord invited the priest to come inside the Holy of Holies. So how do you get into the... When you first come through the gate of the sacrifice, you're in. But if you're going to get close to God, you've got to go through all of the other procedures to get to where he is when full fellowship with him. And prayer is the last thing that the Lord uses to get you into the Holy of Holies. That's why I mentioned so much, two, two lessons on prayer. Now, we've gotten inside. Christ is there above the mercy seat. He's above the mercy seat in his Shekinah glory. He's between the two cherubims. The mercy seat, and I'm going to talk to you about that for just a little bit here. And what's inside the ark were the three items. There was a dish of the manna. There was the budded rod of Aaron that budded and produced fruit, which is all a type of the resurrection of Christ and the, the man a type of the bread of Christ. And then there was the third thing, which was what? The Bible, the law, the tablets that Moses received written by the hand of God. So God put all of those under the mercy seat, which means no man can ever live totally by the law. So God gives to us his mercy so that we don't have to try to live by the law. He covered it, but it's still preserved. And the law is still important, and that's the law of the Old Testament. Okay, I've said all that. Now listen to this carefully, because I want to give these to you. We have, we have seen that the physical needs uh, were met by the manna. The spiritual needs were met by the rod that budded, which speaks of the resurrected Christ. The law, which was the Bible, the written word of God, was written by the finger of God, speaks of the moral needs that we have as God's people to live by. So physical, manna, spiritual, the resurrection, and moral, the law. Now with all of that, I want you to understand the mercy seat was pure gold and no wood, salvation and mercy purely of deity. And so we saw that. The dimensions of the mercy seat are given in length and width. In other words, uh, the breadth of the mercy seat speaks of the wideness of God's mercy. The, 
the depth of that speaks, or the thickness of that, does not give a measurement, which means you cannot measure the depth of God's mercy. It's beyond measurement. His mercy is so great you can't measure it. So it did not give the thickness, but it gave the width. And the thickness is not given because you cannot uh, even consider or go beyond uh, the measurement of God's mercy. Now the covering was called, remember, a seat. A seat associates with rest. Nobody sat down. They did not sit on the mercy seat, although it was called a seat. There was no chair that was ever provided in the tabernacle for the priests. The priest's work in the Old Testament never completed. They were always busy, active, either out there the, at the, uh, uh, the brazen altar making the sacrifices and doing all the work that they're doing out there. They didn't have anything, no chair on the inside of the tabernacle at all. They couldn't sit down. They still had to be active and so only one priest ever sat down. And that was our high priest, Jesus. The priests of the Old Testament never did complete their work, so they didn't sit. The high priest, Jesus Christ, he completed his work. And what does the Bible say? He ascended up and sat down on the right hand of God. And the sat down means he rested from his work. There was no more work for him to do. He's already done all the creation. He's built his church. He's, uh, he was crucified and did the work for our salvation. So his work was done. It was completed so he could sit down. And he's the only one, the only priest that ever did. Then we see the cherubims. I want to show you these cherubims. Go to the book of Ezekiel and find uh, chapter number one for just a moment. We've looked at the cherubims before, but I want to give you a brief uh, illustration of this. If you look in the, in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter number 1, those cherubims that were over the mercy seat, looking down onto the mercy seat, where both God himself dwelt, his Shekinah glory, and the blood was applied on that mercy seat, those cherubims the Bible says, has four faces that mean something to us. I'm going to show them what they are. Ezekiel chapter 1, and look at verse number 10. As for the likeness, and of course you can find that they're, they're talking about uh, the cherubims, but it says, as for their likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and, the, and they four had the face of an ox, on the left side, and they four also had the face of the eagle. Now, it says that also in the book of Exodus, but I'm showing you that there are four here because these four are going to describe the Lord even more so in the book of Ezekiel for Ezekiel to be able to preach about the Shekinah glory. But here's what I want you to see. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, the cherubims, as you remember, were guardians. They guarded the tree of life. When God put Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. He set the cherubims on the outside of the Garden of Eden so they could guard anybody from coming into the Garden of Eden and eat of the Tree of Life because of the aid of the Tree of Life, they would have lived forever as a sinner. But God put the guardians out there, the cherubims. Now these cherubims are in the Holy of Holies back there in the tabernacle. They're above the ark. They guard the Shekinah glory. They guard the God's mercy. They guard His blood. And, the, and they have the faces. Now notice, we, I showed you there, and I can show you in Exodus as well. But the cherubims uh, had four faces. First of all, the face of a man. What did that represent? That shows intelligence. In other words, it portrays the omniscience of God. Intelligence. The face of a lion, always, because it's the king of beasts, suggests the king's power. That shows his omnipotence. So we have the omniscience that's portrayed in the cherubim by the face of a man. We have the omnipotence, all power, by the face of a lion. And then there's the face of an ox. And the face of the ox suggests preserving labor in the universe. In other words, God's working in the whole world. And we're going to see more about that as I speak this morning, Lord willing, on this eclipse that's coming tomorrow. 
but the omnipresence. So the face of an ox represents omnipresence, the face of a lion represents omnipotence, and the face of a man uh, represents omniscience. Then there's the face of the eagle, and the face of the eagle speaks of the swiftness, very quick, very fast, and the power of God to be able to see all. You've heard of the eagle eye. It is keen, it is quick, and the, and the eagle can see. And that's why God gives to us those four faces. And then we also can see the access to him and communicate with him in his presence. This was the whole purpose of the tabernacle was to be able to get into God's presence. Uh, to provide a place where God would meet with man was the purpose of that tabernacle. God wanted to meet with man. That's why even when Jesus says where two or three are gathered together in my name like we are right now, we are gathered together in his name. I am there in the midst of you. He said, I am in the midst of those that are, are gathered together. You know who's here right now? Jesus is here right now. He's in the midst of us. Thank God for that. So now, let's talk about that picture that I just gave you of the high priest. Uh, if you will, go to Exodus chapter 28. And we'll probably not get through with all this as much as uh, if I can get, if I can go through it kind of rapidly because you're already familiar with a lot that we've already studied about this. But go to Exodus chapter number 28. And this is all, Exodus 28 and Exodus 39 are all about the high priest and his garments. For example, if you go to Exodus chapter 28, it says in verse 1, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and beauty. Our high priest, as you see in Revelation chapters 1 and 2, our high priest is in the garments. It even mentions his garments in Revelation chapter 1. And it produces the evidence of his glory and his beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to concentrate him. In other words, set him apart from anybody and everybody else. That he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, this is all portrayal of Christ, and I want you to understand that. This is a picture of Christ, and I'll show you how that pictures him in, in this study. Verse 4 says, And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, an embroidered coat, a miter, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. Now let me just give you some thoughts about this. Only in the ephod of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet and fine twine linen with cunning work do we find, this is the only place, gold that's woven into the fabric of the tabernacle. There's lots of fabric in that tabernacle. There are the curtains and the different veils and so forth. But this is the only place where you find the gold woven within. And that says in verses number six and seven, and they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and of purple, of scarlet and fine twine linen with cunning work. Cunning means perfected work. Totally, completely perfect, cunning. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. So let's notice that, verse 7. The gold depicts deity that, you know, the deity which depicts God. Heavenly origin, where it text talks about where the, the colors are, the gold, the blue, that's heavenly, the purple, that's royalty. The scarlet, that's the blood. And fine twine linen, which is totally white, that's his righteousness. That's what it's all made out of. 
that look how God has given to us a picture of himself by dressing the high priest in these particular uh, pieces of garments. Now, like I said, the gold depicts deity, heavenly origin, royalty, our high priest. And then verse 7 says, joined together. In other words, the people were joined together with Aaron, the high priest. That is a figure of the church joined together with our high priest, Christ. Jesus, the eternal high priest, joins man to God. So joined together. Now, on your little picture here that I give to you, I want you to notice that verse 7 uh, talks about the ephod. In fact, I think it even mentions the word above that, uh, where it's called, yeah, verse number 4, and an ephod, a breastplate and an ephod. An ephod is nothing more as far as our uh, vernacular term is concerned, it's an apron. Underneath this are his garments of, of his robes, and we're going to look at that as well. But verses 6 and 7 talk about the ephod, and the ephod is what you see. You can see the robes underneath, but you see the ephod on the outside, and it's nothing more than an apron covering the robes. And we have that, and we have that in, in these verses, verses 6 and 7, but I'm just trying to help you to understand what each one of these pieces of garments are. Then if you'll notice also, uh, chapter, uh, verse 28. Let's see, we're in Exodus 28. Look at verse 28. And it says this, And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, heavenly, that it may be above the gir a curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. So now here's what you have. The curious girdle, can you see the two, I guess you would call them, uh, I don't know what else to call them other than the straps that come down where there's a, a kind of a belt like going around the, the waist of him there. Okay, that's what, that's what that's talking about. That's the curious girdle. The curious girdle goes around him and then it has those two straps coming down in the front of him. And so what I'm trying to get you to see here based on what the Lord is telling us in this passage is that the curious girdle binding the ephod securely was the girdle's purpose. In fact, there's some other verses that we can look at that that would help us. I think, look at chapter, uh, or Psalm 93 verse 1. Go over there if you will for just a moment. Psalm 93, verse 1. I'm trying to rush through this a little bit because if I can con conclude this, we can start on our new one maybe next week. But look at Psalm 93, verse 1. 93, verse 1, and, and it simply says this. The Lord reigneth, talk about the Lord, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with, clothed with strength, where we, wherewith he hath girded himself. There's the girdle. Girded himself. The world also established that it cannot be moved. So this is, this is actually speaking of service. He's girded himself and, and, he's, and he's going to serve because he's got the ephod on him. Then the next thing we notice is this. Uh, the curious girdle and then we notice the shoulders are a symbol of strength. Look at verse, uh, Exodus 28, verse 9. And thou shalt take two onyx stones and grave on them the names of the children of Israel. Boy, this is good. Six of their names on one stone and the other six names of the rest on the other stone according to their birth. In other words, in the Old Testament it's according to their natural birth, but in the New Testament it's according to our spiritual birth, okay, on the shoulders of the high priest. The names are on the shoulders of the high priest. Verse 11, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, and by the way, if it's in stone, you can't erase it. It's engraved in stone. Shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel, 
Thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold. In other words, taking on the same characteristics of God. We are, our names are set in ouches of gold, which speaks of, gold speaks of deity. So we become Christ-like. We are like Christ in the sight of God. We have been sanctified and justified as we had never sinned. And Christ had never sinned, so we're justified just like he is. And, we, and that's what this is talking about, that we, we have uh, the ouch, uh, where names are set in the ouches of gold. Look at verse 12. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. Now watch this statement. And Aaron, who's the high priest, shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Now let me ask you a question. Is it true that shoulders represent strength? Absolutely. It represents the strength of a person. And so here are the names of the people of Israel the 12 tribes, according to their birth, on the high priest's shoulders as he enters into the Lord, the Holy of Holies. What is that? That's showing to us that our names are brought into the presence of God by Jesus, who is our strength, and we are as if, as if on his shoulders. We have his strength to live by. We can't live by our own strength, but we have his strength, and our strength is represented in the place of God, where God dwells in heaven. That's what that high priest is all about. We have a high priest that's doing the same thing for us today. It's an awesome thing, but there, that goes even further than that. Watch this. In verses 15 through 21, if you look at this, and it says, And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work, in other words, perfect, after the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twine linen shalt thou make it four square, in other words, equal. It shall be being doubled, a span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. Okay, now we're talking about the breastplate. See that little breastplate on the, on the breast of the high priest there? A span in the Bible is a nine inches. A span is when a man would make a measurement of nine inches. Here's a span. That span would go like this. That would be the length of it. The span would be like this. That would be the width of it. And so the span is just a, a nine-inch square that covered the breast of the high priest. Then it goes on to say, And thou shalt set in it, verse 17, Settings of stones, even four rows of stones, as you see there in your uh, picture. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, a carbuncle, and this shall be the first row. And every one of those means something, and I don't have time to go through all of those, but they have a special spiritual significance. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a liger, as agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, and an onyx and jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of the wreathen work of pure gold. Now, what does this say about that breastplate? It's got all the names. It's got all the names on the shoulder that gives us strength. In the presence of God, we get the strength from God by the high priest Jesus bearing our names before the throne of God in heaven. The breastplate covers what? The heart. And the names were on that breastplate that covered the priest's heart. Do you know what? Jesus knows your name. And he has your name on his heart. I hope he, he is on our heart and in our heart because he bears our names on his heart. He's the high priest, and this is all a representation in the Old Testament as to what Jesus Christ would represent to us today in the New Testament. 
We are on his shoulders. We go by his strength. We're on his heart. He loves us. And we're to love him back with our hearts. And so that's the, that's the breastplate. And that's the uh, uh, shoulder uh, as well. Now, God's people are on the heart of the high priest. And he's bearing our names continually. According to our birth, <laughs> according to the new birth that we have, we are on his heart by our, our names. Now, two places are the names. Uh, he's our strength and we are on his heart. Now, the breastplate was a span long, like I mentioned, and wide. It was a square, in other words, showing a square being totally equal, and that's the way God is. He's equal in everything. And he forms a pouch. Look at chapter, uh, look at verse 16. I think that's where I want to be, right? Look at verse 16. Yes, four square it shall be being doubled. See it being doubled? That breastplate was on a cloth that doubled. And there's a reason why. When it doubled, it formed a pouch where something could fit in the inside of it. Well, we're going to find out what that is. Notice what it says. It says four square it shall be being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof and a span shall be the breadth thereof. Now, why is it doubled? Look at verse number 30. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment. Now watch this. That's why it was doubled, to make a pouch. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim. And they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. What a great and wonderful truth. But what is the Urim and the Thummim? The Urim and Thummim is defined in the Bible and in other places as number one, as lights and as perfections. Christ was, has made us lights. Ye are the light of the world. And he has made us perfect. In the sight of God, we are just as we had never sinned. We're justified. When we got saved, he cleansed us from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. And on the inside, every wit, our body, soul, and spirit has been made perfect in the sight of God. Even though we are yet sinners, in the sight of God, God does not see our sin. We are covered with the righteousness of Christ. And that's why that pouch that he put the Urim and Thummim in is a representation of lights and of perfection. In other words, Christ sees us as the light of Christ and sees us as the perfection of Christ. So even though you and I are sinners, God does not see us. We are on his heart. He's taken our judgment, and that's what the talk is about judgment there. He's taken our judgment, and we are walking in the light in the sight of God, and we are perfect in the sight of God. All we've got to do is just wait for the rapture, and we'll get a body glorified under his. Amen. But we are already in his sight, perfect. Amen. That's the Urim and the Thummim. Think about how great this is. Think about that we're on his shoulders. He gives us strength yeah. by name. Our names are on his shoulders, portraying his strength for us to make it through this life. And while we're journeying through this life, we are on his heart by name. And God sees us with being in the light and being perfect as we make our journey through this life. What a wonderful Savior that he portrays us with that in the high priest. So, let me see if I got something else here. One of the, okay, the robe, the robe of blue, that's in, uh, and I don't have time to take you to, but look at verse 31, Exodus chapter uh, 28, verse 31. And it says, And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue. Now, don't forget, anytime you read about blue in the Bible, it's talking about the origin. And the origin of blue is heaven. So the robe of the ephod, all of blue, all of heaven. And there shall be a hole in the top of it. 
In other words, it's going to be one solid piece except for the hole that's going to slip over the head and over his whole body. That's the hole. And it says, in the midst thereof it shall have a binding of woven work round about the whole of it, as if it were the whole of a hemorrhaging that it be not rent. In other words, it won't tear. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue. Oh, pomegranates. What's in a pomegranate? Have you ever eaten a pomegranate? Have you ever opened up a pomegranate? Red seeds. Does Genesis talk about the Messiah coming as the seed of the woman? So the seed and the red speaks of the blood, and Jesus was going to be with pure blood, <laughs> and he's going to be the seed of the woman and not of the man, because if he's the seed of the man, that's why he had to be virgin born. If he was the seed of the man, he would be a sinner like us. But the seed of the woman is God that put the seed so that he would have the pure blood that the pomegranate represents. So Jesus the Messiah is that pomegranate. Okay, now let's go on. Then he also says in verses 33 and 35, look what he says. And beneath upon the hem of thou shalt have make pomegranates of blue and purple and of scarlet, round about the hem thereof. See it there on your, uh, you see the ephod, then there's a robe under that, which is uh, the robe, but watch this. On that robe are bells with the pomegranates of gold between them round about. Let me hasten to say this. That picture right there gives an ex ex explanation as to what we're going through right now. Now, the, the longer robe is the linen coat, and that's expressed to us there in verses 38 and 39. But here's what happened. When the high priest went once a year on the Day of Atonement, and he was invited in by God who dwelt between the cherubims. He was dressed in this garment as you see on that picture. On the bottom of his robe was the pomegranates expressing the seed and the blood. Then there was a bell. And all the way around that robe was a bell and a pomegranate. A bell and a pomegranate all the way around. Now why the bell? And I could take you and show you some verses about heaven having the bells of joy and so forth. But here's why. When the priest went in, and I show you the little laver that he's carrying, and he's taking the blood in as well, he sprinkles that blood on the mercy seat. And if God accepts that blood for the atonement of all the people of Israel, on that particular day of atonement, all of Israel encamped around that tabernacle are listening. What are they listening for? They're listening to see if God accepts that atonement blood on the mercy seat. And the priest on the inside, when he walked in, and he's now in the presence of God, and he places the blood on the mercy seat, the priest cannot control his joy. And bells speak of joy. Ring the bells of heaven, we sing. And there he is, it's accepted, and he gets so excited that he begins to actually have almost a holy dance. And when he does, all of Israel encamped round about hears those bells banging against the pomegranate. And a shout goes up from all of the people of Israel that God has accepted the atonement and their sins are forgiven for another year and there's joy when the bells hit the seed of the blood that redeemed them. Amen. Is that awesome? That's exactly what the Bible is talking about. And so we find that that, that, that picture there that I gave to you is something that maybe you want to just look to and reference it and read the scripture there about it and all. Uh, let me see here if I missed it. Oh, yeah, the miter. I, the miter is, is, the, is the, the felt on top, and then the plate of pure gold is the band that goes around, and it says, of course, holiness of the Lord. In fact, look at verse 36. I put my glasses away. Look at verse 36 of chapter 28. And here's what it says. 
And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, pure gold, pure gold, and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. So when the priest went in and came up to that ark of the mercy seat, he had on his band the knowledge that God is the Holy One, the holiness of the Lord. And when Jesus went into, he ascended up into heaven, sat down on the right hand of God, and he would have had that emblem of the high priest, holiness to the Lord. Don't we serve a great God? Okay, I hope you've enjoyed the study that we've had so far in the tabernacle. I'm not sure that we're going to go any further with it, but I'll let you know next week. Thank you for your attendance. I wish I had time. I really would uh, like to have maybe next Maybe next Sunday, if you'll remind me, and you have any questions or any comments about the study on the tabernacle, maybe we can find out about those next week. Okay? God bless you. Thank you.